Actually, I still remember in 2011, we hear about lots of, about the demonstration going on the street of Damascus. Once I was in the old city in uh, nearby my work or back that time, and uh, I saw like 25 guys, 25, 30 person, like trying to make a demonstration, trying to, to let the people join them. It takes like two, three minutes maximum. They were shooting the, the demonstration by mobile cameras and this stuff. And then from the sudden when they saw there's no one joined them in that area, it was in the old Damascus. They start running like someone trying to attack them while the security forces and policemen were standing there trying to push the, the people of the old Damascus who is living in that neighborhood who get angry from these guys, trying to push those people away from them, like tell, let them say whatever they want. They have the right to say, to talk. And we are not going to harm anyone, especially they are not saying anything wrong. They are calling freedom. So they didn't actually they didn't insult anyone. They didn't do anything wrong. So the police forces try to hold the, to beat the people back. And they say, when they are breaking the rules, we will get involved. But the people of this neighborhood should stay away. It's a police uh, jobs, and just start running like someone trying to catch them or hurt them, and they disappear between the small streets. And we were making fun like what kind of demonstration of uh, they are they were doing. I went back to to my office, and I was I was uh, still watching the news on Al Jazeera at that time. You remember that there was the conflict in uh, Egypt, Tunisia, Libya. We were following the news at that time. So they had the breaking news uh, saying uh, a demonstration in uh, old Damascus between 2,000 and 3,000 person were having a peaceful demonstration and then the security forces attacked them and it was like, okay, they were, they were between two, uh, 25, 30 person, not 1,000 not a hundred as well, just 25 to 30 person and the police forces was trying to hold the, the people of the neighborhood who were angry and not accepting what those guys tried to do in their neighborhood and uh, it was like okay Jazeera you are lying you are just having bigger number much more bigger numbers of what's really happening on the ground and you lie about the forces attack while no one attacked and they showed exactly what they were shooting by the mobile and what you could see that someone holding a mobile camera and trying to, to escape from something but you can hear the voices about like yeah run away run away the police behind us blah blah blah, blah all this but there was no one I was witnessing this I didn't listen to any kind of media so officially, this is a, the biggest lie which I really witnessed with my eyes. No, no one told me about this. Mm. It was the first moment when I was like, okay, there's something really huge and really big is planned for this country. I didn't know at that time what's really going to happen, but it was really so obvi obvious for the Syrian people about what's going on in Syria. And then you used to watch Al Jazeera um, and your friends too. Uh, how did you react then? This was the first time I found that they were lying, so I was just trying to make my own research about what's what's happening in Libya, in Egypt, in Tunisia, just to see maybe it was a mistake what's happening, what's happened with with this demonstration. So I have friends in Libya, in uh, Tunisia, in Egypt. All of them, they just approved the story I told them about that yes that's what we had like in Egypt there was like five millions in the in the square in the uh, independent square in uh, Egypt but uh, the, the population of Egypt is uh, 90 millions like five millions decide they don't want this president and they make all these problems and they were they were all talking about someone get trapped outside of Egypt and get back to Egypt to make this revolution which is just cooked up as we said in Syria they are cooked outside in the western kitchen and bring this revolution for us the revolution should not be cooked anywhere should be just come from the people for the people 
and what we have here is just like Al Jazeera say something, CNN say something else, BBC say something. Else. Everyone trying to grow the the number, make it bigger, make make it worse. Like you are in Syria, you are in Damascus right now. You witness that we still have our normal life. Okay, we have uh, mortars falling on the city, but we still have our life. According to Al Jazeera, Damascus is destroyed. According to CNN, there is no life on on in this country. So the lies keep going and going and going. What we find out in 2011, just we still found it till now because I still stand time watching, try to see what they are trying to to tell the people. So you go to Al Jazeera Arabic, the biggest lie ever you can find over there in English. They they try to lie, but a little bit less. Al Arabiya the same. And each each channel just has backed up back at uh, a group of the opposition which is not I don't consider it as an opposition mm -hmm. foreign fighters coming to my country to fight is not an opposition and they are not really looking for freedom for the Syrian people the lies is about uh, what's really happening here in Syria like the opposition fire mortars to, to my city and then they say that uh, the regime is attacking by airstrike and then from the sudden they say that uh, uh, land muscles from Ru uh, Soviet muscles we have in the Syrian army, they say they launched against the civilians area. And then you find that there is two injured. Like I used to, to have a training on these muscles when I was in the army and the destruction these muscles, this kind of muscles do in any area, it, it will not injure two or three or even ten it would kill more than a thousand so they are trying to say lies and because people they don't know about weapons they don't know really what kind of rockets that we are using or the government using and they say this is what the government used what when actually it's a mortar shield fall from went out from the opposition areas and it it hit not a military unit, not a, a, a force, an enemy security forces unit, not a governmental uh, place. It just hit a civilian market, mm -hmm. civilian business. It it always attacked the the civilians, and they are always in Al Jazeera trying uh, to show it as the uh, the Syrian armies, the Syrian Arab army attacked this area, mm -hmm. which is the biggest lie. I always witness a lot of mortars falling in, in Damascus and I saw the citizens falling on the ground and died because of these mortars and when I watch Al Jazeera I, I hear them saying Syrian Arab army did that. Yes, every day here in Damascus we hear some either mortar or cannon fire, you know, but the reports here are that as you said the mortars mainly they're not accurate, they're just uh, landing in civilian areas, but every every day, is that right? Yeah, but some sometimes when the weather is is bad which is as as you can see it's very very few days during the year that we have bad weather but yeah every day almost every day we have uh, mortars falling in the city if not in Damascus like there is the small village called Germana they ha they have like every day more than 15 to 20 mortars this is the minimum range they have falling in German now like every day and uh, about the accuracy about of the mortars well you cannot have any accuracy with this kind of mortars it's a very old weapon don't have any accuracy and it used it it has to be used by uh, the militaries in uh, the second world war and the first world war and it should kill as much people as it takes that's how we they use it uh, back then in the first and second world war. But now they are using them to hit at places in the city, and the city is a civilian city. Most of the population here is civilian. We have few offices for the the army, like the headquarters and so on. But it's it's civilian areas. It's civilian city, and all what they they achieve is killing civilian people, mm -hmm. like. Most of the time, 
when they launch these mortars, it hits the markets. They are trying to uh, to push the Syrian people. If you are not going to support us, we are going to kill you. So either you go out of the country or you support them or you are dead. You made a decision, I think, um, I'm not sure exactly when, to join the National Defense Force. Can you tell us why you, uh, when that was and why you joined uh, NDF? Uh, yeah, uh, the decision was uh, I had a friend who, wa who was killed. He's a m our murder, the first murder of my friends. His name is Raya. He was uh, a player in the national team of the basketball. And at the same time, he is a teacher, sport teacher in, uh, in a school, private school in Syria. He got shot 11 times in the chest, in the neck, because uh, he was a supporter for the president. According to them, it's his opinion. He didn't hold any weapons, he didn't do anything. He was working with kids, he teaching sport, with, which is something we all needed something so peaceful and he, he was killed for his opinion at that moment I was like okay that's it if we are going to just stay talking to the people who is going to shoot at us we are, all, we are going to be all dead so the first thing get to my head was to protect my country I should go back to the army so I tried to rejoin the forces, the, reg the regular army, but uh, they said that you are specialized with, th with uh, something we don't need at the moment. So when we need you, we will call you. After, after like six months or something, they established the NDF. So I just and applied for them and I joined them because I think it's my duty to to protect my my land, the land that give me everything to grow up and to be the man that, that I become at this moment. And uh, what sort of, you, you think a group leader, can you explain what your role is in the NDF and what you do day to day or week to week? Uh, actually I'm a leader of a group for small range engagement with the enemies and uh, we are our our mission is always to uh, to to get to the civilian areas w which were occupied by the opposition which is 90% of them are foreigners Pakistani and Chechenian and uh, so on you have multinational army fighting against us so we n we were trained to for the city wars the street wars we know how to deal with this kind of wars like sometimes we, we have engaging in the same building or in, in the same flat and sometimes in the same room so not the regular army was not, wasn't tra trained to, to have this kind of war and when they stopped the idea of establishing NDF was to not destroy the country the troops of the NDF they know how to go inside the building secure the building and have this small war inside the, the same building without destroy it the regular army or what they know they can use their artillery and bomb the the building destroy it and they kill everyone this is the idea of the regular army that's why they use the NDF and now we have lots of units in the regular army after all this time they they had the, their their own experience and they have their own training for the uh, the street wars and they know now they are joining us in all battles for cleaning buildings and streets and even cities, like what we achieve in homes. So I think last night you were called out, um, and was that a typical type of operation last night that you went out to? Yeah, actually what we got last night was, uh, we have some intelligent information that there is a few, few groups of the opposition, actually not the opposition, it was ISIS and Nusra Front, they were planning to sneak from uh, Jobar and uh, Kabun inside the city through Abbasin Square. So we had the information, we were prepared, and what, what they called me for it was just for the backup if it's needed. Uh, our guys there, they stopped the, the tourists who tried to get closer to the city. 
they did a great job. There is so many losers in uh, the opposition or ISIS. And uh, thanks God there is no one injured in, uh, in our groups. Uh, this is something not really regular, but from time to time they try to, to get out of Jobar or, uh, or Kabun to sneak inside the city. First of all, the idea, the idea they have like, okay, we go out of a danger zone because the, the, SA, uh, the SAA trying to, is going to, to clean this area. So if we don't go out, either we, they capture us and we go to prison and then to the court or we will be killed during the fight. So they try to go out just to escape from the fight and they can do their own small groups inside the city and attack from the inside, which is the most dangerous things. That's what we are trying to do. We are trying to protect the Damascus from this kind of uh, actions because it's so dangerous they will take the civilians as uh, hostages and it will be so much dangerous for the civilian people more than anyone else. In fact you saw uh, there was a big scale operation just like that you were describing in Adra recently I think. Can you describe what happened in Adra? In Adra there was a huge uh, attack from the opposition from uh, coming from Douma and it was backed up by uh, Saudi Arabia and they believe there is an official army units from Saudi Arabia army supporting those guys yeah, I'm not sure about the numbers someone says 4,000 someone says 8,000 uh, they go there they have list by names uh, the, at least uh, with the names of the people the civilian people who lives in Adra they slaughtered those guys who has their names. It's not about uh, sectarian things. What they say, they are killing the Alawis and Shias and they save the Sunnis, which is not true, actually. They, they capture everyone who used to work with the government because they say that if you are working for the government, you are supporting the, uh, the Kuffar, according to them, the, the unbeliever. So they slaughter them in front of their families and who try to resist they kill him and kill his family and we have some heroic people there even through the civilian people one of them is an injured he has two children one is 12 as I remember one is seven years old and his uh, wife in the house he saw the the ISIS coming from the window so he just gather his family in the bedroom and uh, send a message to his cousin saying wish us a good life and pray for our souls the ISIS is coming and we need your your prayers now he, wa he had a small grenade with him so he hide it till the ISIS members came inside to the house and then they go get inside the room they tried to take him to kill him and to take his wife as a prisoner or actually we all know is what they are doing with the women. So his reaction was just about opening the grenade and blow it in the room and he killed himself, the kids and the wife. And at the same time he killed eight of these terrorists. It was unacceptable for him to, to watch his family killed in front of him. It wasn't acceptable for anyone. He died with honor and dignity, defending his family. I think they, they still, to this day, they have a lot of uh, prisoners or hostages there. Yeah, I'm not sure about the number they still have. And they said that they will try to execute all the hostages if uh, the Syrian army continue this operation. That's why the army now trying to, to do a new strategy. Uh, with this uh, situation, they, uh, they sent small groups, four or five guys, with uh, light weapons. Usually now they are using, as we call it here, white weapons, the, the knives of, uh, of the AK-47, that what we have, trying to not engage with fire, to not make lots of sounds and to bring attention. So always the fights with knives now and trying to to continue with liberating uh, the city and so far they are doing good so far 
and hopefully in the next few days it will be liberated and all the prisoner with the ISIS will be liberated from this terrorist hands. Why, why did the, uh, these armed groups, why did they take Adra? What, were, what do you think they were trying to achieve? A punishment for the Syrian people to not support the opposition. This is what Saudi Arabia said, that if you are going to support your army and your president, we are going to let you pay for, for this. Mm -hmm. So they are taking revenge from civilians because they didn't accept these extremist Islamic groups that are coming inside our, our country to make it their backyard to where they can play wherever they want. Do you see some progress? Do you see that the crisis that the, the Syrian people are managing to uh, overcome this crisis? How do you see it moving? I think it's moving in very well progress. I think in some area it will take some time to forget. Or actually, no one can forget, but to forget. It will take some time, but I, th I believe there is so many peop Syrian people, even the, those people who were oppositing the, the president and the government, now they, they, they open their eyes to see what, what they brought to this country. And now they are supporting the, the Syrian army, even some of them, they volunteered with us to protect this country against those uh, tourists who came inside from, from the whole world. Are there members of different communities in your NDF is volunteers, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, do you know what sort of mixture of uh, communities you have in... Yeah, the it's exactly just like we were before the army and like we were before in the normal cities. We, we, we are all from different backgrounds. We have the educated people, we have uneducated people. We have all sex fighting all together. Actually, we don't talk about this, but now usually we know it's because of their city. But we, ha we are from all different sects. We are from all different religions. Like people that they, they will not believe. We have Jews, Syrian Jewish fighting with us. We have Syrian Christians fighting with us. We have Sunni, Shi'i, and uh, Alawites, Durzi. We have all kinds of sects and religions who is living in Syria and who believe that Syria is their country. They are all still together, fighting together, shoulder to shoulder. We are not talking about where are you from or what what religion do you believe. We believe this this country is for all of us. And your religion, your prayer is only for God. I don't really interesting to know what others believe. It's it's their their problems, their opinions. I don't really care. I do what I do between me and, and the God. It's between me and the God, not between me and the whole people. Are you hopeful for the future of Syria? Yeah. Syria had so many crises before, and this is just a new one. And this crisis was uh, import to, to my country for what we have done. Because we are independent, we are not accepting any uh, any orders from the U.S. and their allies. Even uh, with all respect for Iranian and Russians and Chinese, uh, we didn't take any orders from those guys. We, we are appreciating their support in the Security Council or by sending items like fuel and diesel and medicines and food to this country. But even, even that, we we still not accepting any orders from anyone. Until today, we don't have that much debt on uh, on uh, on Syrian government. We're still living our life. We have short stuff in the markets, but we're still alive. We're still doing our life. We are we still our citizen people. We're still going to the coffee shop, to the restaurant, even they go to nightclubs, celebrating their birthday. We still have this kind of life. We are strong from inside, and we will continue. And this crisis, as I told you, it's just one crisis. We had a lot before, and I'm sure it will not be the, the last one. But what we need is to union our people again. This is how we, we, we're strong, because we, so far we are union. And we should get back all those Syrian people who, who thought about fighting SA, SAA before. We should get them back. We should start getting our union again. 
so we can stop all this scams coming out from outside. Thank you, Sam.